like to personally thank you for your offering. I'm sure it'll be used up with in God's kingdom. This morning we want to turn to John chapter 19. I start reading around 17 verse. I read a little story the other day. Um, I guess I'm now pouring paper a little joke about senior moments. I right, share it with you today. I thought of Brother Jimmy right off the bat as soon as I read it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this lady called in the newspaper office. Oh, she was mad and irate. She's like, where's my Sunday paper? Where's the beetle? It's late. It ain't, I ain't received it yet. I don't know where it's at. They said, but man, today is Saturday. She said, oh, that must be why I wasn't at church either. <laughs> This morning I want to talk a little bit about some of the different one, you know, myths in general. One of my favorite shows on Discovery Channel is Myth Club. They, they hear all these myths, people write in, call in, email them, whatever, and they test it out to see if it's true or not. And that's kind of what we need to do with God's Word in the Bible. And a lot of people just take stuff for granted. I mean, you hear scientists say something, oh, it's got to be gospel, it's got to be the truth. We believe everything's got to be dealt with by the scientific method. There's a problem with that, you know. But when it comes to the Bible, how are we going to do that? How can we sit down and test the resurrection? Was did Jesus, was he resurrected? Can we sit there and do it over and over and over again? There's no way we can prove it that way. Nor is there no more way that we can prove that you had eggs for breakfast this morning. There's no way I can go back in time and prove that scientifically. You know, scientists have these tests in laboratory where they just test and test and test and get the results and write it down. They form hypotheses and then after they figure that out is true or not, they make it a theory and sometimes on into a scientific law. And there's no way we can do that with anything else. There's, you know, with Abraham Lincoln president, we can't go back and do a scientific method. We can't. There's no way we can reproduce that as in history. But what we do have is legal historical method or the evidential method. And that's where we use oral evidence to prove something. You know, I can talk to people that eat breakfast with you this morning and find out if you had eggs or not. Written evidence, maybe you put it in a journal or a diary, and I can find out about that and read it. Or physical evidence, maybe I'm at your house watching you eat it and I'm sharing it with you. So this morning, like this, some of the written evidence we can use, of course, we can't go back and do like an oral interview with the people of the Bible. There's no way we can do that, but we can get the written evidence by reading God's Word. And this morning I'm going to start reading on John 19, verse 17. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, called Gotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, and made four parts, and to each soldier a part, and also a tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece, and they said, Therefore among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. You, know, you see right here, the soldiers, they crucified him, they're witnesses. We can read that through John's writing here. John obviously witnessed this, so did the other, other Gospels. And the other disciples and things wrote letters. And I'm going to go on now to, uh, you can read on there. He's talking to John. He says, Behold your mother. And he, Mary was there, Mary Magdalene, Mary the wife of Clovis, and Mary's sister, and a bunch of them there. You can read all the different witnesses. I'm going over to verse 41 now, chapter 19. Took, see. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden they laid a new tomb in which no one had been, yet been laid. So there 
they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for a tomb was nearby. Now they put him in a tomb, rolled a rock over it and sealed it. Then we go on to read some more accounts here of what happened the next day. And uh, verse, uh, chapter 20, start, I'm going to start with verse 18. You can read on through here. The first few verses, Mary went and she found out. Stone was rolled away. Jesus was gone. She runs back and tells, uh, I think, Peter and uh, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, tells him they go check it out for themselves. And you can see different ones all through here in the other Gospels as well. Different ones seem that he was gone out of his tomb. It says, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. <coughs> then the same day, at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he laid it, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas apparently wasn't there according to his next few verses. He wasn't with the disciples at that time. So it says, Now Thomas called the twin, called the twin. one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see the, his hands, the prints of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, the disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, and the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands. And reach your hand in here, and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, and yet yet have believed. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now we can't prove this scientifically, but we can get the written evidence here. We can, we can look for physical evidence. If we want to fly over there and check out the tomb ourselves, we'll see that it's empty. And even though we can't talk to people that are in the Bible at the time and get the oral evidence, we should be able to talk to other Christians and get the evidence that way orally. Because once we've been buried, baptized with Christ, and risen and raised up out of the baptism, we've put on Christ. And we should be able to see Christ's light living in all, through all of us. This time, Brother David, we make Thank you, Brother Bill. I, I want to thank the Lord for this another opportunity to share His Word. Uh, if you would turn in your songbooks to 593, the waters. This will be our song of invitation today. If there's anybody here today that's not a Christian, if you would like to give yourself, give your life to the Lord at that time, if, if uh, you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, and uh, you simply say a prayer where you are or repent. Ask the Lord to to help you to start living for Him and, and to change your life, that you might start living right and start living for the Lord. Uh, at that time, if you've done those things, then you would be a, a fit subject to uh, to confess Jesus Christ before men. You confess Him as your Lord and Savior and be baptized for the remission of sins. Uh, I'd like for you, if you would, turn with me to uh, James chapter 3. And uh, what Brother Bill was talking about there, about the different ways that, uh, that we have ways of finding the truth. Uh, there are a lot of different study helps and things out there nowadays. And we're, we're told we're to study God's Word and rightly divide God's Word. And, and we need to do that. Each and every one of us as Christians need to continue to study God's Word and to continue to, to grow in grace. You know, I... Peter had said, you know, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. But you know, if somebody's been a Christian for 20 years, 
They shouldn't still be on milk. What would happen to an infant if it started out drinking milk and 20 years later it still all it had was milk? It would be malnourished. So we need to continue to grow. We need to continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as Peter said. So we need to look for the meat as well. And when it comes to studying, we need to, I guess as, as ministers, as elders, as those that are responsible for God's Word, we need to study even harder. And this message I'm, is, is for me today. And I hope and pray it, it splashes out on some of you as well because it really it fits every one of us. Because every one of us have a ministry. Every one of us teach others by the way we live our lives. Whether we actually go to the Bible and say, look what it says here. Or whether we just live our lives as Christians. Each and every one of us in some manner have an influence on someone else. In James chapter 3, the first verse says, My brother, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The word masters here is, is as it's used several places in the King James, it's, it's a teacher. Be not many teachers. Now James is not trying to talk people out of being teachers or out of teaching God's word. He's not trying to do that. But he wants the teachers to make sure that it's by God that they're doing this. Be not many teachers knowing that we shall receive a greater condemnation or a greater judgment. We need to get it right. If somebody's going to take the time to teach, you need to make sure that you're teaching what's according to God's Word. We can't just come in here and, and make things up or, or say things that might make feel somebody feel good. Sometimes when we use God's Word, it offends people. You know, I've said before, and I've heard others say it, you know, if I've said anything here today to offend you, I apologize. But if it's God's Word that offends, there's nothing I can do about it. If it's God's Word that offends, you better talk it over with God. You better go to His Word and see what it is that it says. As a minister, we're told in Peter that we're not to be lords over others, but we're to be examples to the flock. Uh, that's in uh, 1 Peter 5, I believe. In Matthew 18, verses 6 and 7, I want to read a couple verses here. These are some verses to me. Uh, some of them I studied pretty hard before I became an elder and started preaching. Some of them have hit me right smack upside the head since then. In uh, chapter 18, verses 6 and 7 of Matthew, it says, But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense when you teach somebody God's Word, it is so important to get it right. Verse 2 says, For in many things we offend all. And, and the word offend here, we, we can look at it as, as what we normally think of as the word offend. That, you know, it, there are some things in the Scriptures that will offend everybody, or most people, especially young Christians, or those that aren't even Christians. But offend is, is actually it's, its meaning here to, to cause somebody or that for many things we offend all or we stumble. We make mistakes. We make errors is what it's speaking of here. And James, the brother of Jesus, is saying here we stumble. We fall. We make mistakes. I don't think there's been anybody up here in this pulpit that I've known that's ever said, I don't make mistakes when I'm up here. You know, and there's something, too, I want to I kind of clarify here. Uh, the Apostle John, even, he said that um, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. He's saying ourselves. John admitted, too, that he sometimes commits sin. You know, it's not just making a mistake. You know, 
I, I got to explain, though, a difference here between an individual, an apostle who's called to the Lord, between him making a mistake or committing sin, and between God's written word. There's a big difference there. They didn't err in writing God's word. God did not make any errors there. He went to the to the people, and, and what they wrote was according to the Holy Spirit. In uh, 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. That means the individual that wrote it, it wasn't their private interpretation. They didn't come on, and I've, I've had people tell me that, that Paul was a chauvinist. It wasn't Paul's private opinion or his private translation that he wrote down, his interpretation of what the Holy Spirit told him. It was what the Holy Spirit said. Verse 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It was not man's will that wrote what was written. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So this is God's Word. <coughs> Are there mistakes in some translations? Absolutely. Because man is the one that translates it. <coughs> so man has made some errors in some of the translations. That's why when you study God's Word, you really it's, it's best if you use several different translations to get an entire meaning of what the Bible is saying, what God's Word is. And God, you know, we're told flowers wither and, and grass fades away, or the other way around, grass withers and flowers fades away. But the Word of God shall stand forever. God protects His Word. But sometimes we need to study to bring it out. We, we just talked about, we finally finished 2 Corinthians in Bible study. We started on it in uh, January of 2005. So we spent some time on 2 Corinthians. And, I, you know, granted, it wasn't every week on 2 Corinthians. We talked about other things from time to time, but according to the Scriptures. And then we had storms and, and things like that where we canceled it from time to time. We had visitation at the funeral home. We spent a lot of time in 2 Corinthians, and I think everybody that went through that got a lot out of it. Um, but this is God's Word, and He protects it. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Who is there that can be perfect in everything? Well, Jesus was, but I think that pretty well wraps it up. The rest of us strive to be complete or perfect. Complete is the word that probably fits the best in today's language. We want to be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And we do that through the scriptures. We're told that in 2 Timothy 3. That it's through the scriptures that we can be made complete. The same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. You know, a, a bit's just a small thing that goes into the horse's mouth, but their lips are kind of tender. When you pull a little bit, they, they don't want the pain from it, so they turn their head. So man can take... A, a humongous animal, really. They're big. And they can do a lot of damage to a man when they're like wild stallions. But man can break them. And man can train them and teach them to do what man wants them to do. To work for them in the fields. To, to be transportation for them. And that's done just with the tiny little bit that goes in the horse's mouth. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven by fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. If the captain wants it to turn this way, there's a he, he turns the helm, and, and the rudder down below, it's, it's just a small little rudder compared to the size of the ship. But even with that fierce wind, even with rough waters, it'll turn. And they can, they can guide that ship the direction they want to go. So you see, not only can man control the beasts to a point, 
They can also control inanimate objects, like a, a humongous ship. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire can be. When we look at man, and we look at the tongue, the tongue is such a small little part of a man. It had determined so much in our daily lives. It says, <coughs> Behold how great a matter the fire kindleth. In Proverbs 26 we're told, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out, so where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. You know, if, if somebody hears something and they're not really sure whether or not it's true, we can go and pass it on to somebody <coughs> else. I don't know if you've ever played that game. I remember when I was in Cub Scouts, I think. We, we played this thing where we got in a big circle and somebody whispered something into this guy's ear. And then he whispered it into the next and you go all the way around with 20 or 30 people. And the last person says it out loud and everybody, at least the first half of them, are scratching their heads. Well, where did that come from? It's something totally different. So we need to be careful when we hear something, what we repeat, make sure it's the truth. And sometimes it still doesn't need to be repeated. But the tongue, it, it says, Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire hell. We need to be careful how we use the tongue. And I, you know, I go back to the first verse here. And to me, this is specifically talking to teachers. But it does hit each and every one of us. It is something that, that all of us have to understand. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and if things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. You can go back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 9. And you can read how God gave those things to man for man to take control of. For man to use for food. For man to use for clothing. And God made the first clothing out of animal skins. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. That may sound a little contradictory if you've just read James chapter 1 and verse 26. It says, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his whole heart, this man's religion is vain. What we're looking at here in verse 8, but the tongue can no man tame, it's talking about how men tame the beasts. But I can't tame somebody else's tongue. We can tame our own tongue with God's help. We go to the Lord and ask for help in this battle. And we can because actually the next few verses are, are talking about that too. That we need to tame our tongue. We're not able to help somebody else tame their tongue. But with God in our lives and in our hearts, we can tame our tongues. Therewith, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith, curse we man, which are made after the similitude of God. We use our tongue to, to curse a man who's made in the likeness of God. And then we turn around and we praise God. Remember when Paul was on his way to Damascus? And he was struck down, he saw this bright light. And Jesus said to him, why do you persecute me? Paul was persecuting the Christians, those that loved Jesus, those that were living their lives for Jesus. And in the same way, he was persecuting Jesus himself. <coughs> so when we curse man, we're cursing God. When we talk evil of somebody, or we spread a rumor about somebody, or backbite, any of these things, we're doing it against what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to do those things. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. 
My brethren, these things ought not to be. How can we bless God with the same tongue that we're using to curse man? And some people will use the same tongue to curse and bless God directly. <coughs> they go to church on Sundays. Now, I, this is so obvious to me in the prison system. They come to the service and they praise God and they sing to him. And then they go out on the on the yard there at the prison and cuss and swear and take the Lord's name take the Lord's name in vain. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessings and cursings. My brother, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? The fountain doesn't have two kinds of water, it's all mixed together. Can the fig tree, my brother, and bear olive berries? We know better than that, either a vine figs, of course not. So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if we have bitter envying and strife, but if ye have bitter envying and strife, in your hearts. Glory not and lie not against the truth. This is as a teacher, as a preacher. You know, there, there's envy that's good. We should envy the good things we're told in, in <coughs> the last verse of 1 Corinthians 12. We're to envy the good things and desire the good things. And when we see somebody that we feel is is following the Lord and is a good example and is living his life as much like Christ as humanly possible. That's something we should desire. We should desire that we could be like this individual. But this says, but if he had bitter envy and strife, if that envying is to the point where I wish I could do that, and then to the point where, well, I think I could do better than that, or I wish I could do better than that, we shouldn't envy others in, in our lives at all and in the teaching. If, if a congregation this size, well, we've got, we've got four basically that preach regularly and we've got several others that are coming on pretty strong right now. But all it would take would be some for some envy to creep in and somebody to try to be better than somebody else. Each and every one of us are here to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's not about us. It never was and never should be. And if it gets that way, somebody better get us back in line. We're here to teach and preach Jesus Christ. The shepherds of the flocks, we, we care for the souls of the people here. That's why we're up here, because we love you. Because we want you to spend eternity in heaven. Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. When we have that kind of envy, those kind of the, the strife that's in our hearts, if we get to that point, it's something that's not coming from above. It's not something sent from God. It's something sent from Satan himself. We're told in, uh, I think it's in 2 Corinthians 11, Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness. Who do you look at as a minister of righteousness? It should be somebody that's preaching and teaching God's Word. When you hear somebody preach and teach God's Word, how do you know it's God's Word? By following along, by looking at it. We're told these people were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they heard the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were said. He was speaking of the Bereans when Paul wrote that. They searched the scriptures daily to make sure it was so. 
But notice before that, they received it first in their hearts. That was the first thing they did with the Word. And after they received it, they studied. They looked at God's Word to make sure that what the Apostle Paul was saying was correct. We need to continue to do that. We need to continue. You need to do that when I'm up here. That's why I want you to follow along. That's why I tell you where I'm at when I read the Scriptures. Because I want you to follow along. Don't forget, i got to go back to verse 1. It's going to be a greater judgment. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. We're told in the Scriptures that that's the kind of thing that enters into the Lord's church. We can't let it enter in. We need to continue to go to God's Word. We need to continue to study His Word. All of us do. That way if myself or one of the other brethren that are up here make a mistake. <laughs> James said he did. John said he did. <coughs> we make a mistake. If I'd have left out the word not on verse 15, it would have changed the whole thing. But it's just a tiny little word. Easy to skip over. That's why it's important that everybody follows along. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful. Notice it's first pure. It's not mixed with anything else. That's required. That's the first thing. And then it's peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. Or it's, it's not stubborn. It's full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, or, or it's no respecter of persons, and without hypocrisy. It's very sincere. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. I want to read uh, a couple verses here. In Matthew... 5 verse 9 it says blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God and in Isaiah 32 verse 17 we're told in the work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness quietness and assurance forever each and every one of us need to continue in our lives to live as Christ-like as we possibly can. We need to live like Christ. The only way we can know how Christ lived is to study His Word. And then we need to live that. It's, you know, we, we hear, practice what you preach. That's exactly true. You know, as ministers, we need to practice what we preach. We're also told we hear, a lot of times you hear, don't just talk the talk, but also walk the walk. Each and every one of us needs to do that. We need to walk the walk. And we need to study God's Word so we know what that walk is. If you're not a Christian today, again, I urge you to give your life to Christ. To start living for Him. If you are a Christian, I hope and pray that, that you've gotten something from the message today as well. That you might start living even stronger for the Lord. That you might get even more studying. And I said right up front, this is this is for me. And I've been needing this for a while. But I thank God that, that he's put me where he has. I fought against it. I didn't want to be a minister. And that, that first verse in James 3 was one of the reasons. But God convinced me that I did want to. And I, I finally got to the point where I said, here I am, Lord. Send me. And it's something that we got to work through. If the Lord is calling you into the ministry, if the Lord is calling you to do anything besides what you're doing for Him right now, talk to Him about it. Study His Word. And if you feel that that's the case, come forward and, and let us know. Uh, speak to one of the elders. You know, we'll, we'll be happy to work with you, and, and you know, I don't think there's any, any congregation I know of any place that ever turns down somebody wanting to do something. This time, let us stand and sing our song of invitation. Free